the situation became extremely tense over the summer months, um, starting with the kidnapping and murder of uh, Hamad Abu Khdir, um, and then obviously the Gaza war compounded the issue, and then we even saw a child, Muhammad Sunukrot, 16 years old, killed at the end of uh, August through a, a sponge round that was fired at him by Israeli forces. Um, and during this time, uh, you know, Palestinian youth uh, erupted in protests and the Israeli authorities used a heavy hand to clamp down on these protests and demonstrations. And according to Israeli media, some 260 Palestinian children were arrested during this three months period, which is a pretty large uh, number. Um, and the way they were dealt with and processed in, in the courts uh, just uh, is, was extremely harsh. Um, oftentimes for minor offenses, children wound up serving uh, quite long periods in, in detention. One thing that I would like to comment about is the fact uh, of how home arrests have been used against uh, children to explain the impact that has on the overall family. So while Defense for Children International Palestine thinks home arrest is a far better alternative to imprisonment, the way home arrest has been used on occasion is, is very troubling. In one case, we had a child placed under home arrest for an 11-month period. Um, and, and for 10 months of, the, of that period, he wasn't allowed to leave his home, even to go to school. And the problem with that is this child that's been placed under home arrest while the Israeli authorities uh, decide what to charge him with. So at this point, he hasn't been charged with anything, just placed under a prolonged home arrest. Um, this child can expect uh, Israeli soldiers to visit his home at any time, every day, twice a day. Uh, that creates quite a large impact, not only on the child who's under home arrest, but on the entire family, including his siblings. Uh, moreover, if, if the child uh, doesn't remain in home arrest, he ends up, his family has to pay a huge fine, and that puts a lot of financial hardship on a family already under a lot of economic duress. And something we often don't mention is that a lot of these uh, Palestinian children that end up caught up in the system, caught up uh, with Israeli authorities arresting them, are already some of the most vulnerable and at-risk children. These risk children are coming from uh, poor economic social backgrounds, um, and, um, and they should already be the children we look out for in terms of are they receiving the right education, are they receiving the right future, but instead what we see happening to these children is an increasingly heavy-handed heavy approach by the Israeli authorities uh, that's aimed really at controlling the Palestinian population in Jerusalem. Most home arrests tend to be for two to three week periods, but what's interesting about these home arrest periods is that the child at this point, when he's placed under home arrest, hasn't been officially charged with a crime. Um, but that said, most children in home arrests are usually denied the access to school, and that really becomes a problem when the home arrest is for a prolonged period of time. Home arrest has a huge impact um, on children because one of the main factors is the psychological impact it has on the child, where the child's home is turned into uh, the prison, his detention center, and his parents are turned into the effective wardens to ensure his, uh, he stays at home. And that creates a very challenging dynamic in the home. And also we see other parents with other children, the friends of this child, uh, preventing them from, from visiting the child because they don't want their child to be associated with someone under home arrest because they're worried about the twice daily raids that Israeli uh, authorities conduct on children that are under home arrest to ensure that they're in the home. Um, and so it just creates a, a split for the child between uh, his friends, between his community, and, uh, and, and worse is that the child feels a prisoner in his own home, and that has a, a huge impact on the well-being of a child. Um, that said, it remains a far better alternative to actual imprisonment in an Israeli prison. The troubling aspect for Defense for Children International Palestine is when that home arrest 
uh, is prolonged uh, for months on end without the ch without the child having any real charges because what that means is once real charges are filed against the child not only would he have endured 11 months of home arrest but he'll also have to endure possible imprisonment after that. Uh, Palestinian children living in East Jerusalem are subject to the Israeli civil criminal law. Uh, we're increasingly seeing the effective treatment of Palestinian children in East Jerusalem very much equal the same treatment that children in the West Bank undergo. Um, and so what that means is uh, that children are often subject to physical violence during interrogations, they're deprived of any legal counsel throughout the interrogation period. And while technically they're allowed to have their parent present during uh, an interrogation, if the parent tries to intervene in any way, he's often kicked out of the room by the interrogator. The youngest uh, age that a child may be in interrogated and face criminal charges at is 12, and that applies to both Israeli and uh, Palestinian children. But what's extremely different between uh, Palestinian children living in East Jerusalem and Israeli Jewish children living in Jerusalem is uh, the fact that Israeli Jewish children are often released on bail while they face charges. Whereas in most cases, Palestinian ch children face automatic imprisonment while they await being officially charged with a crime. Often children, some as young as 12, find themselves alone while being interrogated and while going through the uh, interrogation process. And so most of them end up confessing whether they carried out an offense or, or not. In fact, what's troubling is we took a random sample of uh, East Jerusalem children that were arrested in 2014, and we found out that over half of them ended up signing confessions in Hebrew, statements in Hebrew, a language most of them do not speak. So what this shows you is that the entire system, whether in East Jerusalem or the West Bank, the entire detention system for Palestinian children, um, has a pattern of abuse that's intended to coerce confessions out of these children. And it's these coerced confessions that are then admitted as evidence by the courts um, in complete uh, mockery of due process and fair legal standards. The problem psychologically for the child is he realizes throughout that process he's very much alone, that his parents can't provide any type of security, that his home can't provide any type of privacy or safety, um, and that has a real debilitating impact on the child. What's worse is once a Palestinian child has been convicted of a crime and he, and he becomes a age, he becomes an adult uh, after turning 18. Uh, what he did as a child is never expunged from his record and continues to affect his life uh, through, and, and continues to affect him throughout his life.